straight ahead on CCX News, it's back to work for local lawmakers. We have perspective on yet another special session. Plus, it's an Olympic sport, so why can't Armstrong students receive a varsity letter in trap shooting? We'll take a look. And later, liftoff for students at Providence Academy. CCX News starts right now. Hello and thanks for joining us. Minnesota lawmakers headed back to the Capitol Tuesday afternoon for a special session to finish their work. And they gaveled the session back to business for what could be an all-nighter. The plan was to meet until 7 o'clock Wednesday morning. Governor Dayton and House and Senate leaders say they have a framework agreement on several issues. $660 million in tax cuts, $300 million on new spending for transportation, and $990 million for public works projects all over the state. Unfinished work includes spending for public schools and health and human services. So why another special session? Eric Nelson sought out a political expert for perspective. All right, thanks Alex and Mike. I'm here at Hamlin University in St. Paul and joining me now is a political expert, Professor David Schultz. And David, thanks so much for your time. Uh, the 12th special session in Minnesota since 2001. Is this the new norm? This is the new norm at this point. And the question is why? And I think it reflects something about the changes in Minnesota, that we used to be a solidly DFL Democratic state. Now we're so evenly polarized and evenly divided between Republicans and Democrats that it's hard to reach consensus. Because think about it, what are budgets all about? They're about values. And if the parties are divided and they're divided on values, we're going to get gridlock in terms of the budget. Where does Minnesota rank compared to other states when it comes to special sessions? Do we see this across the U.S.? We see it much more frequently in Minnesota than we do in many other states. Now, there are some states that have, have almost full-time legislatures that meet all the time, but among part-time ones, we seem to be one of those states that runs up against this sort of deadline or going into overtime far more so than almost any other state in the country. What are your takeaways from this 2017 session? Well, the takeaways are is that it's going to be noted for what? The fact that we now legislated and allowed for Sunday liquor sales. That'll stand out. But what it really takes away is the fact that, guess what? I don't think anybody really won in this session at the end of the time. Because, again, they were talking about getting all these things done in time. They didn't. Um, they were talking about trying to sort of reach a grand compromise. Yes, they did get that grand compromise. But when did it occur? 10 minutes before the clock emptied out. And so I would describe this as yet again another failed session, um, although at the end they did reach some compromises, reach some agreements. I think the Republicans compromised more than, than Governor Dayton did on this one. Does this continue to fuel that stigma and stereotype that some have that these politicians get nothing done and all they do is bicker? I think it does. It, and, and on top of the fact that I think politicians are human in the sense that, like everybody else, they procrastinate to the last minute, um, what it really sort of shows here is a couple things. One is that, again, they are so entrenched in their political positions. And part of the reason why they're so entrenched is that with exception of maybe 20 in the House and about 10 in the Senate, the rest of the legislators are from safe districts. They have no incentive to compromise. It's only people who come from swing districts that will compromise. And so they're so entrenched, they're just not going to have the political incentives to work together. And that's what we're seeing here is that failure to work together because of that political divide in Minnesota and because of, guess what, lack of leadership to hold them together. Quick final thought, what's the cost to taxpayers? What's the cost to taxpayers? Well, for the special session, it's going to be in the thousands of dollars, probably the tens of thousands of dollars. But in terms of sort of the cost, in terms of yet another black eye, priceless. Yeah. All right, Professor, thank you so much. That's David Schultz. We're here at Hamlin University. We'll go back to Alex and Mike in Brooklyn Park. All right, Eric Nelson, thank you very much. In Brooklyn Center, a deal to bring a golf entertainment venue to the Regal Movie Theater site also includes plans for a new highway interchange. Dallas-based Top Golf plans to acquire a nearly 14-acre site at I-694 and Highway 252 from Tennessee-based Regal. This week, we learned those plans also involve Brooklyn Center building a full-access interchange at 66th Avenue and Highway 252. According to Brooklyn Center Mayor Tim Wilson, the project will receive federal dollars and is just awaiting state or county funds. In Brooklyn Park, the City Council has given preliminary approval to a new housing development near the Champlin border. 
National home builder D.R. Horton is proposing 55 single-family homes on smaller than typical lots east of Winnetka Avenue and south of 109th Avenue. The, south, the sale prices would be between $315,000 and $350,000. The project has city officials excited considering the lack of options at that price point. A Brooklyn Park Charter School has an upgraded computer lab thanks to a very generous donation from Minnesota Timberwolf, Tyus Jones. This is the new Tyus Jones Creative Learning Lab at XL Academy. On Monday, Jones donated 30 computer monitors, keyboards, and other gear. Money donated by Jones also helped renovate the classroom. While school officials are grateful for the donation, they are equally impressed by the message that came with these gifts. The other thing that was really unique about Tyus' visit is this motto that he talked to the kids about, writing your own story. Um, it's basically, you never give up, no matter what obstacles you face. He just came with such a phenomenal message for our kids. The school partnered with Jones after the school's dean challenged NBA and WNBA players last year to a shootout. Jones took part in that competition and he decided that he wanted to help the school even more. It is an Olympic sport, yet some high schools, including Armstrong, don't allow students to letter in trap and skeet shooting. Students and parents are trying to change that. Neil Persley has more on the shotgun sport and the issue that remains unresolved. I can do this. I can compete in a sport that's not traditional. Armstrong senior Jamie Waltzing is the captain on the trap team. It's a sport where anybody can participate. Armstrong math teacher Mike Moore is in his fourth year coaching the trap and skeet team. First year we started we had 26 kids on the team. Um, now we have 58 kids that are total on the team through trap and skeet. According to the Minnesota State High School Clay Target League, it's the fastest growing high school sport. But unlike many other schools with trap teams, Armstrong High School doesn't allow their students to letter in the sport. I put it on my letter jacket anyway, but just because I could. It didn't seem right to some of the parents, so they started a petition on change.org to lobby Patty Weldon, the activities director at Armstrong, to allow the kids to letter. I think they're still saying no for now, but hopefully that'll change. A high school could make that determination under their own separate criteria, and some high schools have done that under separate criteria. We haven't done that and the activity director and the high school principal have said they have no interest in doing that. So in a last ditch effort, Jamie and some other students went before the Robbinsdale School Board during an informal listening session to plead their case. I gave them the facts, you know, safest high school sport, fastest growing sport in Minnesota. With over a thousand signatures collected on their petition, hopeful students are in a holding pattern. It'd be a big thing for them and they'd be very excited to have that letter and be able to show their school spirit. As an outgoing senior, Jamie can only hope things change for the teammates coming after her. I feel like I can help the, the next generation of kids hopefully be able to earn a letter the way I couldn't. In New Hope, Neil Persley, CCX News. The Robbinsdale School Board has sent the issue back to district staff asking for recommendations. The board could decide to follow the wishes of the activities director or direct high schools in the district to issue letters for trap and skeet shooting. Still ahead, one of the best ways to keep your bones strong and your joints limber. That's next in Health Check. Plus, Armstrong and Maple Grove battle in a close match in the Section Boys Tennis Playoffs. But first, the return of sunshine. Wednesday will feel like a big improvement. As people get older, they lose bone mass and their joints become stiffer and less flexible. But exercise is one of the best ways to slow down or prevent problems with muscles, joints, and bones. And in this week's Health Check, Dwayne Cleveland shows us what a Plymouth senior living community is doing to help residents improve their mobility. And slowly lower down, switch to the other sides. A dip in the pool is usually a relaxing time. But twice a week at Trillium Woods in Plymouth. Palm station to center, raise up up the side, lower down towards your knee. Oh yes, you works as hard, but you watch. All right, come up from there. Feet together, we'll do some side hops. A group of a dozen seniors gather for aqua size. 
a 45-minute class aimed at helping participants improve the strength of their muscles, ligaments, and tendons. The nice thing about water is that it takes about 90% of your body weight off of your joints. So if you have any knee or hip issues, it's a great alternative to working in the fitness center. Alternating presses forward. One of the class participants is 83-year-old Austin Pryor. He has arthritis in his knees and wears braces to help with his lateral movement. Keep your chest up, shoulders down. He's been in the class about six months. It's fun and wonderful exercise. Stuff underwater. He says it's wonderful because water can act as the great equalizer. The class can be done by people of any age or fitness level. All right, going back, we'll skip. Participants do exercises that work their upper and lower body. They do balance work, and all the while, they stay in constant motion for nearly an hour. It's great on your joints. Our water is kept at 86 degrees, so it's fairly warm, so it's very comfortable for the residents, improving their range of motion. Losing bone density is a normal part of the aging process. Okay, lower down, go back to jogging, pressing forward, alternating arms. But exercise can help the bone stay strong. Eyes forward, abs in. Pryor says since he started the class, he's already stronger in the upper body, and he has high hopes for what Aquasize can do for his longevity. Hopefully uh, give me another 10 years of good life. Okay, slowly lower down, we'll switch to the opposites. In Plymouth, Blaine Cleveland, CCX News. In addition to exercise, of course, it's important for seniors to eat a well-balanced diet with plenty of calcium and vitamin D. Well, still to come, why spirits are sky high for some students at Providence Academy. But first, two of the area's top baseball teams battle in a defensive duel. Jay Wilcox steps in next. I'm Jay Wilcox with sports. The YZ on Maple Grove baseball teams are each aiming for repeat visits to the state tournament. The Trojans are defending champs in Class 4A. The teams met up in a late season playoff tune-up on Maple Grove's home field on Monday afternoon. And it's a pitcher's duel. Wyzetta's Peyton Gallagher freezes Josh Tyler with runners at first and third as the game stays scoreless. The Trojans trying to swipe a base in the third inning, but nice execution by Maple Grove results in the out at second and it stays 0-0 through three innings. Both teams have had good pitching and defense this season. Crimson first baseman Charlie Horton digs out the low throw to keep Wyzetta off the bases here. Dylan Peck gets some more help from his defense as Hayden Thompson will show good range to make a play and get an out at first base here. Nice grab up the middle, and it stays scoreless through five. A little scary moment for Peck here as he reacts just in time to knock down the Will Oberg line drive, and he tosses the first for the out as the, as the hitters continue to come out on the short end. Maple Grove trying to get a threat going in the bottom of the six, but first baseman Jack Rothstein makes a very nice play to get the lead runner. The Trojans again get out of the inning with no damage done. But in the bottom of the seventh, that changes. Luke Hansen comes through. His hit scores Horton easily with the only run of the game. Maple Grove pulls out a one to nothing thriller. Maple Grove's girls lacrosse team is having a strong season. The Crimson are in second place in the Northwest Suburban Conference with one game left. Maple Grove at home to take on Centennial Monday night. Nice play here. Chloe Corbin flips it to Emily Herdeen, then cuts and gets the return pass to score for a one to nothing Maple Grove lead. Less than a half minute later, it's Paige Casibo to Abby by for the goal and a two nothing Crimson lead. And Grace Hansen surveys the defense and finds Taylor Helvey for the first of her three goals. It's four to one Crimson. Herdeen scoops it up, makes a hesitation move, and then buries the tough angle shot for a 7-2 lead. It's 7-4 Crimson at the half. Second half, and Casibo gets it to Herdeen for the goal and a 9-4 lead. Then Maple Grove holds off a strong centennial rally to win 10-8. They play Coon Rapids in the regular season finale on Wednesday. Spots in the team portion of the State Boys Tennis Tournament are on the line this week. Three of the four teams that made the semifinals in Section 5AA are in our CCX viewing area. That includes number three seed Armstrong taking on number two seed Maple Grove in one semi. Nikita Snezko serves for Armstrong at number one singles and fires a blistering forehand winner and he beats Josh Miller 6-0, 6-0. 
Second singles, Joe Lipovitz is a very good player, player for the Falcons. He sets up a volley winner with a tough serve as he breezes past Andrew Dumbald, 6-0, 6-1. But Maple Grove dominates the doubles. Billy Ayler serves, and Davis Pfaff's good hands at the net win the point in the number one doubles match for the Crimson as they beat Evan Gellner and Constantine Fisher. Second doubles, and Maple Grove's Josh Hogue and Ben Bakke win this point and the match over Ben Leeton and Garrett Radall. Grove also wins at third doubles. That means Armstrong needs to sweep singles to take the match, and that's exactly what they do. J.D. Urban in the far court at number three beats Harrison Schindel in three sets. Armstrong edges Maple Grove four to three to advance to Tuesday's final against top seed YZ. As we saw, Nikita Snezko secured one of the team points for the Falcons in that section win over Maple Grove. John Jacobson profiles the senior on this week's Sports Jam show here on CCX. Here's part of what you'll see. At six foot five inches tall, Snezko has the range and reach that not a lot of his opponents possess. But his nine inch growth spurt since freshman year led to injuries before it led to improvement for his game. The past few years I've been injured a lot because of growing, I've been growing so much. I've grown like almost a foot in the past four years. So my serve has improved tremendously forehand, footwork, mostly everything. And then obviously my mental game has improved the most. Oh, he's just so consistent. He keeps the ball in play, um, mostly baseline, but most, uh, he can hit cross court and uh, hit some drop shots. He'll come up to the net occasionally and has a good net game. And you can see the rest of that story and more this week on Sports Jam. It airs through Wednesday at 3.30, 6.30, and 9.30 p.m. on CCX channels 12 and 7.99 and online at ccxmedia.org. That's all for sports. Mike and Alex, back to you. All right, Jay, thanks. Up next, Elton John would be proud. And Providence students try a new rocket adventure when we come back. And finally, a sky-high demonstration of engineering. We mean at 800 feet. Are you ready? We're going in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. <laughs> It was an impressive launch considering Providence Academy High School students built the rocket themselves as an extracurricular with the help of the Tripoli Rocketry Association. The launch exceeded the students' expectations too, reaching an altitude of more than 3,800 feet. That's roughly the equivalent of 13 football fields. It showed uh, how a lot of the things that we, we do in the, in the engineering world here um, can come together in a project like this. So uh, between the physical building of it to uh, and, and how to make sure that it's not going like, to fall apart on you um, to everything uh, about the rocket was also guided in electronics as well. This was the first year that Providence had an extracurricular rocket club in the school put together these impressive videos of the launch as well. They actually had to get FAA clearance in order to use that high-powered rocket. That's incredible. That does it for us. Thanks for joining us. See you tomorrow.